will be reporting on the joint work with Yves Benoit. And, um, well, at least in my eyes, um, this work is uh, related to Marcel in a very special way. And then uh, when uh, we first started working on this subject, um, we were both staying in Berkeley. And it was uh, the last time, actually, I was, uh, I had a contact with Marcel. Um, the setting off was to tell him about this work. And at this occasion, uh, he uh, told me his memories uh, about his own stay in Berkeley in the early 60s, 60s yeah. Uh, that had been uh, one of the turning points of his career, as well as a magical adventure for his whole family. So. so this talk is an outgrowth of the Shun conjecture. It states that um, any quasi asymmetric map from uh, the hyperbolic plane uh, into itself is within bounded distance. from a, a unique harmonic map. So this conjecture has been proved true quite recently by uh, Markovic. And then further extended in a joint work with uh, Marcus Lem, to quasi-isometric maps from uh, the hyperbolic space into itself. So, what uh, is a quasi-isometric map? Well, a map is quasi-isometric whenever it is a uh, by Lipschitz at large scale, meaning that uh, the distance between the images of two points is bounded above and below by affine functions of the distances between these two points. You can take the same C. That's not a problem. So what is a harmonic map? Um, a harmonic map is a critical point for the Dirichlet energy integral. And as far as smooth map are concerned, um, a map is harmonic if and only if it is the solution of a certain uh, elliptic PD. So, now we know that uh, quasi asymmetric maps from, let's say, nice hyperbolic, gram of hyperbolic spaces to another gram of hyperbolic space uh, do have a boundary value at infinity, and that two such maps share the same boundary value whenever they are within a bounded distance from each other. So another way of rephrasing this conjecture, I mean, now it's a theorem, is to say that um, we have a preferred <coughs> representative, namely harmonic representative, for the family of all quasi-asymmetric maps from Ag to Hd that share the same boundary value at infinity. Okay? So my goal in this talk is to extend this result by weakening both the assumptions on the spaces we work with and on the map. So the theorems 
with the following. It states that any coarse embedding between uh, pinched Adamar manifolds <laughs> is within a bounded distance. from a unique harmonic map. So, what is a pinched Hadamar manifold? Well, first, it is a Hadamar manifold. Namely, it's a complete, simply connected uh, Riemannian manifold. And instead of only requiring that it has non-positive curvature, I will ask that the curvature, namely the sectional curvature, is bounded between two negative constants. Now, what is a coarse embedding? Say that a map between two metric spaces is a coarse embedding. When you can control the distance between the image uh, of two points in terms of the distances of these points. Both functions, uh, phi 1 and phi 2, that appear in these inequalities, are required to be non-decreasing and unbounded. Okay? So, it is obvious that you, for course embedding, you can always assume that the function phi 2 here for the upper bound is an affine function, but uh, here you have uh, much more flexibility. So it makes um, quite isometric maps, special cases of course embeddings. And uh, I may say that uh, our result is already interesting for uh, quasi isometric maps, but slightly more general. Okay. So I would like to give uh, examples, application of our result. So first of all, uh, well, I insist on the fact that uh, in our result, uh, we do not assume the source and the target manifold to be the same. And we do not even require them to have the same dimension. So for example, an instance of uh, our results give the following. An equisy circle <coughs> is the boundary value of a unique harmonic map. So, there are um, lots of uh, equivalent definitions for quasi-circles, uh, which have many, can have many different flavors, but, uh, well, the one which is easier for me to use today is to say that a quasi-circle 
the map from S1 to S2, the, one, the circle to the two spheres, that is the boundary value of a quasi-asymmetric map. And then it is the boundary value of a unique harmonic map. Okay? So, another example. Um, it will still go from H2 to H3. Then take H2. I select the geodesic here and I draw all the orthogonal geodesics to this one that I just selected. And then I will construct a coarse embedding of H2 in H3. So what I will do is I will take this, which is like a vertical plane here, and I will bend it so that this geodesic will go to a curve here. And I send it with a constant speed. And then each one of the geodesics is sent move to the geodesic, vertical geodesic, which is orthogonal here. And if um, you do, it, do things properly, um, the map from the geodesic to its image here will be a coarse embedding of R into H2. And then this construction will give you a coarse embedding from H2 to H3. And what our theorem states is that uh, this coarse embedding is from a bounded distance from a harmonic map. So before going uh, into some proofs, so I would like to state two earlier results. The first one by Pensu, and uh, it states that uh, any quasi-asymmetric map either from the hyperbolic space over the field of quaternions into itself or from the Kelly plane over the octonions into itself is within a bounded distance from an isometry, which is, of course, a special instance of a harmonic map. So this situation is more rigid than the other ones I'm usually dealing with. And uh, there is also a similar result. Uh, due to Kleiner and Leib for maps between higher rank symmetric spaces. And well, of course, what I should have said here is that uh, the first example you should have in mind of a pinched at a mar manifold is a symmetric space of one point, one compact type. Okay. So now what I want to do is to, it's to give you a first and tell you about the overall strategy of the proof. And then I'm stuck. So I asked before my talk how to get to Black Boss Town. And somebody <laughs> told me there was something to... Oh, you have to work for it yourself. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I was expecting something to hang from the blackboard. How do we prove this result? So we start with this coarse embedding and 
we want to find a harmonic map which is uh, within a bounded distance from f. So what we do is to solve a family of uh, bounded Dirichlet problems with boundary condition f on a family of balls that exhaust the source manifold x. And what we hope for, actually what we prove, is that uh, this series of harmonic maps will converge to a harmonic map which is, which is uh, within a bounded distance from f. So in order to make this strategy work, the right move is to begin by smoothing f out. So the target manifold uh, is um, Hadamard manifold. So you can use a center of mass procedure, basically. And then uh, this uh, built uh, smooth map, which is within a bounded distance from f, and uh, which is smooth. X and y have the same dimension? Nope. It's life. You take the image of a small ball, and you take a center of mass of the image, and you do not, I mean, it's not a problem. Uh, may I assume that f is smooth with bounded derivatives. So step two. is uh, just what I told you about. You fix a point, an origin in x, and uh, for any radius r, you consider the harmonic map, which is defined on this big ball with center O and radius r to y, and which is solution of the Dirichlet problem with value f on the boundary. So the existence, uniqueness, and regularity of the solution of this Dirichlet problem are granted due to results by Hamilton, Shen, and Ullenmeck. So, now, step three. This step is actually the core of the proof. And uh, it consists in providing a uniform bound for the distance between these two maps, the initial map, the initial um, course embedding F, and this harmonic map HR, solution of the Dirichlet problem. So, what I mean by uniform bound, that is it does not depend on the radius R, of course. So once this step is completed, we are good. <coughs> because you just have to use a standard compactness res uh, procedure. To get the theorem. So the main ingredient here in this result is the, the Cheng lemma. So what does it tell? It tells us that in this setting, when you have a bound on a harmonic map, 
you have a burn on its differential. So you know how F behaves, it's a course embedding. The HRs are within a bounded distance from F, so you have a bound on the HR locally. And on their differential, a little elliptic regularity gives us bounds on higher derivatives, and then you just uh, use a scully. <laughs> and this tells us that uh, the family of uh, these maps HR converges, or at least sub-converges, to a harmonic map, which is within a bounded distance from F. Okay. So this is a proof for existence, and I don't want to go into the proof of uh, uniqueness, because I don't have time to. So what I would like to do in the time that remains is to get into, to give you a few details on how this proof of step three goes. Not so many details. But, uh, <laughs> um, so, as I said, we fix this point O and we consider these harmonic maps HR that coincide with F on the boundary of the ball. And we want a uniform bond for the distance between these two maps that I will denote by dr. So what I will do is I will proceed by contradiction. Actually, in a sense, we get uh, an explicit bound. And uh, proceed by contradiction, meaning that for some R, we assume that uh, this distance between these two maps is very large. So th this is the ball I'm starting with. Now this distance is reached at some point, x0. And um, with some, well, of course it is not reached the boundary because on the boundary the two maps coincide, okay? But uh, with some work, it's not obvious, but with some work, uh, we can say that when the distance between the two maps is large, this distance is reached far away from the boundary. <coughs> so 
so I don't say it's obvious, you need to work. The distance is reached far away from the boundary. So that I can draw a large bow with a large radius L that sits comfortably inside the domain of definition of uh, HR. And then I will completely forget about this bow and focus my attention on this one. This is supposed to be the center. Okay? And uh, what I will do is study the images under, basically the images under map F of geodesic rays starting at this point. Okay? So, the key point that allows us to state our result not only for quasi-isometric maps, but also for cross embeddings is the following. Um, the point is that we have information uh, concerning the images of uh, geodesic rays under Kof's embedding, and uh, namely, what to know that for almost all, uh, what we can prove is that for almost all geodesic ray with origin uh, X naught, its image goes linearly. infinity. And uh, we have a similar result for a couple of geodesic rays, for almost all uh, pair of geodesic rays with origin x naught. The images, of course, under F, the coarse embedding, pull away from each other <coughs> linearly. Well, obviously, I'm being really vague in my statements, but okay. And just to give you a flavor of the proofs, it just uh, use volume estimates. and the borel cantelli lemma. So that in this sense, cross embeddings share property that we know are true for quasi-asymmetric maps. Okay. <coughs> so now, using these results, I will be able to choose wisely two geodesic rays with origin uh, x naught, psi and ether, I will study here uh, the images under the map F. <coughs> so 
Actually, I will be only interested on this point, eta L and psi L, where uh, the geodesic, the, these geodesic rays intersect the sphere here. And what I will prove, basically using this, but not only this, only also the fact that uh, F is a coarse embedding, once again, uh, what I will prove uh, is that the angle seen from uh, the image of this point under F between uh, the images of these two points What I will prove is that this angle, well, perhaps is not large, but it is bounded below by a positive constant that does not depend neither on the choice of L nor of the radius R. And on the other hand, I will prove that this angle has to be small and it will be my contradiction. Okay. So how do we prove that this angle is small? Actually, so we prove the same angle is small when L and R are too large. How do we do this? Well, actually. So what, what was the angle between psi and eta in the beginning? Ah, I don't know. Uh, soup, 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 soup. I mean, whatever. I don't care about the angle of these guys. What I know. Oops. Well, they haven't invented a thing common. Hein? Uh, what I know is that I chose wisely these two geodesics. And that the, the images of these two geodesics um, will <coughs> pull away from each other. So if L is large enough, I mean, it's not only a consequence of the fact that they pull away, but how they do pull away step by step, <laughs> F being a uh, coarse embedding. And what I, what I am able to prove is that if I choose uh, these two geodesic rays wisely, then the angle between their images will not be small. You have to have my word on this. I, I cannot give the proof. Okay? But on the other hand, I will prove that practically, however I choose psi L and eta L, the angle will be small. And this will be a contradiction. Okay, so you can... There are pairs of rays so that the angle yeah. is big. And, and but it should be small. Okay? This makes sense? And what really makes the thing work is this. This property that coarse embeddings share with quasi isometric maps. The point is that you don't have the information for all judges queries, but only for almost all. As it would be, I mean, for quasi isometric maps. Okay. So to prove uh, this uh, angle is smaller, So I will draw yeah, what I will be interested in. I will take as an origin uh, the geodesic ray that goes from the image of X0 by under F or under uh, the harmonic map. And uh, 
I will introduce the image under the harmonic map of psi L, as well as the image under the quasi-asymmetric map F of psi L. I will do the same drawing with eta. And I'm, what I will prove is that this angle is small. It would be the same with eta. And so this would say that uh, it's not like I have drawn on the, on the blackboard, of course, but uh, it would say that uh, both f of psi l and f of eta l are within a small angle from this Joe's ray. So the angle between them cannot be large. OK? So we have uh, two different arguments, one for this angle and one for this angle here. And so how does it go? Well, for the first one, I will be interested uh, in uh, this geodesic segment and its image <coughs> under the harmonic map. It goes from the image of X0 under HR to the image of Psi L under HR. And so we have a bound for HR because we know F is coarse embedding and we know the distance between HR and F. So we have information, we have a bound for this map. And the Chang lemma tells us that we have also a bound for its differential. So we have a bound for the length of this curve. On the other hand, I state that this curve cannot go too close to this point. Why that? It's because the map, the function, which is a distant function to a fixed point from an harmonic map, is a subharmonic function. So, if, say, this point had an image which was too close from this point, you have a bound on the differential of the harmonic map. So, you know, the map will, would stay too close from this point on a neighborhood whose size you control. And then you would control, will have a contradiction using the subharmonicity of this function, because um, the value here has to be less or equal than the mean value on this circle. Here it is really too small, here it's not too large, so it will not compensate. Okay? So this proves basically that if the distance between your two maps is too large, then this angle is really small. And for the other one, I will do the last triangle I'm interested in on this other blackboard. Then you want to have an estimation for this angle, so you will uh, estimate the Gromov product of this triangle. and show that it is large. So this distance here is large because, as I have said, the image under F of a geodesic ray, it goes away to infinity linearly. This is the first statement on the, on the blackboard. Right there. So this distance is greater than a constant time L. Now, this distance here, while well it's certainly smaller than the distance between F and H, this is HR, sorry. Okay? And, well, I'm cheating a little bit here. Uh, I can choose sine and eta 
so that this is larger than dr minus alpha l over 2. So why that? It's basically the same argument as it was here, using the subharmonicity of uh, this function. Because, well, it's this, well, it's this, right. okay, same argument there. And so this is larger than uh, whatever, uh, alpha l over 2, which is large if l is chosen large. This means that the angle is small. And then I have the contradiction that I predicted. So I think it's time to stop. I have a question concerning the harmonic map that you find, which is unique. Can you say something about the, the fact it's an embedding, or...? No, 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 I don't think. I don't think no, it no, is. Even in, uh, in uh, easy instances, um, uh, no, I don't. First, one, one thing I should say that I've been cheating uh, shamelessly here. <laughs> What I told you there uh, is makes perfect sense when we're working from a symmetric space to another one. Because when I say almost all, everybody knows what I'm speaking of. When you want to extend this to uh, Pinstead and Marmen, if all you have to know which respect to which measure you are working with. And this will be harmonic measures. And to do this, uh, you have to have estimates on the harmonic measures uh, for cones. Any other questions? The, the Pons service art which you quoted at, at the beginning, is that that's very special because of the sort of quaternions and octonions? Yeah, it? so it's very rigid though. Mm -hmm. And so the harmonic map, which is within bounded distance of the quasi isometry, actually is the identity. I mean, I mean that there are not so many quasi isometric mm -hmm. maps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's thank Dominic again for clear talk. <laughs>